Hey, everybody. Welcome to the DIY Musician Podcast. It's Christina. Um, I'm excited about today's episode. It's with Samara Jacques from Miami, Florida. She is an entertainment lawyer. Um, you can find her online as The Latte Lawyer on Instagram, TikTok. Um, Samara is one of those incredible people that is full of like a wealth of information. And I have a feeling she might become a regular on this podcast because she is way smarter than me <laughs> when it comes to anything legal. Um, we talk about copyrights, which is a pretty dense subject. And like, admittedly myself, really unversed, non-versed, unversed on podcast, on copyrights. Um, yeah. So, so much so that I don't know what kind of verse I am, but I know that I don't know things about it and that I've led people astray and I definitely have pretended like I've known things about it that I don't know. And that's why we needed to talk to an actual lawyer. So without further ado, here's an actual lawyer to answer all your questions. Let's get on with the show. You're listening to the CD Baby. CD Baby. CD Baby. DIY Musician Podcast. It's Samara Jacques, um, Esquire, as in legal lady. <laughs> um, okay, I like that name. Legal, <laughs> legal lady. lady. I'll put that on my, I think I might put that on my um, business cards. It sounds like a Golden Girls episode or like a Designing Women, like Legal Ladies. That's the theme song. If I already didn't like that name, (laughs) I love it now because I watched Designing Women and Golden Girls like I was a woman in her 50s when I was younger and I loved it. Yeah. Designing Women in particular. I went. I had a little moment like a few years ago where I was maybe a little depressed and I watched every episode of Designing Women for like two months. Cool story. Anyway. Um, I think it's cool. I like it. I think that works. And thanks. they had representation of a gay character way before mm-hmm. it was like, I guess, normalized. Mm-hmm. And I loved, loved, loved him. I thought he was great. They talked about the South. They talked mm-hmm. about a lot. They talked about, it was like a really like, yeah. Um, well, you and I met in Miami in September now. I can't believe it was so long ago. Um, right. Because we were both at an event, a songwriting camp, and you spoke on copyright law. Um, You are a lawyer in Florida. You also have an incredible social media. I would like to shout out to the Latte Lawyer um, for all of the amazing, like, information that you provide independent artists. I think that the one of the questions I get asked the most from other indie artists is questions about law that I cannot answer and I never attempt to, but things like copyrights, when should I do it, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I have been giving really bad advice for years about it. So I decided, Hey, let's stop that now. Um, I think like I heard really bad advice when I was starting out and just started regurgitating that as if that was okay. And we're going to put an end to that bad advice. Um, I'm not the poster child for somebody that has their shit together when it comes to their copyrights. I think, um, yeah, I'm not even going to say it out loud, the fact that I may or may not have them, period. So (laughs) let's go ahead and start um, and talk about them. Um, how did you become passionate about this subject? I know that you dealt, you you handle artists on all different types of things, but this one in particular, I know you're pretty passionate about. I think the reason why I became so passionate about it is because it's something that's actually very easy to do. It's a low barrier of entry to understand how to do copyrights. And that's your first, like, uh, that's your first uh, line of defense, right, to protecting your art. So that's why I really got interested in it because I realized it was uh, easy for artists to do. And Mm -hmm. once I showed people how to do it and they don't have to pay me $250 an hour to do it, I got even more excited about it. So it's accessible. um, It's easy to do once you know how to navigate the Copyright Office website, which does look like it's from the 1980s. But once you do it once, it's not hard to do. Um, And it shows artists that if they can do this, this is the first step. It makes them feel more empowered to do other things for themselves, like negotiate contracts and understand other things. So that's why. I'm going to just go ahead and say the bad advice that I received early on, and you can start negating it. Um, okay. Basically, from the very beginning of songwriting, I was told, and this is real, and 
<laughs> I'm sure other people have heard this too. Oh, no, I'm scared. Yeah. If you just send yourself a piece of mail that has like the demo, the CD, at the time it was CDs, and yeah. like the lyric sheet that you wrote the song and you set, you timestamp it and you send it to yourself back in the mail, you're good. Who You don't need a copyright. And then the other one, once we got more digitized, was um, if you have the like original song recording from when you started writing the song like in Ableton or whatever and you like you have that first file date dated to March 15th 2006 then you're good you don't need it it'll hold up in a court of law so those sorts of things I think were really bad advice that I received that has kept me even personally as a music industry um semi-pro <laughs> like kept me from actually going and doing the work. Um, go ahead and tell us why all of those things are incorrect. Well, that what you're referring to is known as the poor man's copyright. And I tell people, no one's poor here. We're all rich. So I don't mm -hmm. believe in that. It's wrong. And plus, actually, it's not legal. Um, okay. So you do have a copyright when you create your music. So what we call it is if it, in a fixed, tangible medium of expression, meaning that it's solid. Somebody can ac access it. So if you make art in the sand, that's not fixed, right? It has to be fixed it has to be a painting or some other accessible form of art right and tangible meaning that somebody else can hear it see it touch it right that's fixed and tangible and needs to be original so if i copy i don't know a raisin in the sun and i just rewrite the whole thing it's not original that's not my art right so it has to be original it has to be fixed so you have a copyright as soon as you have those two things so once you put in ableton you do have a copyright what we're talking about is the protection of that copyright right and that's where the registration comes in. And so a lot of people think the mailbox rule, I don't know who came up with it. I'm mad at whoever that person is, but yeah. they will tell a lot of people to send postage and mail it. To, I've seen people say, mail it to yourself. And I'm like, well, why would you mail it to yourself? That doesn't make any sense to do that mm -hmm. because it's the copyright office that actually confirms your registration. They have to give you a certificate. You need to mail it to the copyright office. You have to send it to the copyright office. So you, it is original, you do have a copyright, but for registration purposes, you have to do it with the copyright office. Yeah. I mean, I guess why even, yeah, to your point, if you're already going through the trouble of creating this poor man's copyright for yourself, just do it right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, right. Just go to the website and do it correctly. Um, yeah. Wow. Well, I'm really glad that you're here to sort of demystify copyrights a bit. Can you share some of like the most common misconceptions that artists have about copyrights that you often encounter or they come to you with? The first thing I would say is that they think that there's one copyright for a song. There's actually two. So there's two copyrights right. you need to register for one song. That's the first one. There's the PA copyright, which is the musical composition copyright. That's for the written melody and the lyrics, right? So for those of you who are older school, I guess, like myself, and you've actually like had to, I don't know, play piano and you know, the song sheets that you have, that would be covering that part of the song, what you see, what, right? What does the PA stand for? Uh, performing arts. Cause okay. there's performing arts and there's a sound recording and there's visual arts. There's a couple. So it's the abbreviation that they use for, good, good question. It's the abbreviation on the form that you have to fill out with the copyright office. It's the PA copyright for musical compositions. And okay. then, when you perform that work on a mic, a very fancy mic like yours, right? That will be a sound recording copyright. So that'd be the SR copyright. So you need to have both to protect your song fully. That's the first thing I think. Um, a lot of artists think that it's expensive to copyright a song. There's actually some tricks that you can do to save yourself money. Like for instance, you're a singer songwriter. I've listened to some of your songs and I like some of your songs. Thank you. So yeah, they're very good. It's always uncomfortable if it's like something I don't like and then I have to just be like, you've made music. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but um, what you can do if you're a singer songwriter that's created everything on your own, you've produced it, you've sang it, you've written the lyrics and the melody, you can do a single application which actually costs you $45 to cover both the SR copyright and the PA copyright, which is actually incredibly cheap compared to what you could do. Um, and also you can do group registration. So normally it costs $130 to register a song, both sides of the copyright, right? But if you do a group registration of music, which I've been pushing on a lot of people, you can register up to 20 musical works. So that written side of the song we talked about and 20 sound recordings for $130. And so, yeah, go ahead. So like an album, like if you have an album, that's, rather yeah. than 
individually copywriting each single on the album, go ahead and do it all as one work. Yes, it's called Group Registration of Album Music. You can find it on the USPTO. Um, and the great part about that is on the sound recording side, you can actually register your liner notes, your album artwork, and any other, other packaging that comes with it. So that's all covered as well. So that's saving you money so you don't have to separately register the cover art too. Mm. So that's something else. And I think another part is that it's hard to do. It's not. Um, it's really actually quite simple to go ahead and register it. Once you've known how to do one, you can do the rest of them very, very easy. It's just the first time that you register it, it just seems intimidating because the website isn't intuitive because it's an old website. Is the group registration the same cost as a single song registration? Yeah, that's the crazy part. Oh, so, gosh. Yeah, yeah, so you can register one single, right, for $130 for the sound recording and for the PA copyright, the composition. But the only caveats for the group registration is you have to publish the work first, which means that you have to make it accessible to the public. But there are ways to get around that. Like, you don't have to register it with your DSP. A private link on SoundCloud can count. Hmm. Okay, good. So okay, you can do this then, before the album release, before the single release, um, by providing a private link. That seems right. like a good barrier or a good way to break that barrier to entry. Right. Um, interesting. Okay. And then what can you go retroactively do this like for things that have been out for a very long time, and Absolutely. still maintain like the legality, let's say you put an album out in 2015, you never released copyrights for it, um, or a cured registered, a, registered your copyright. Thank yeah. you. Real words. <laughs> yeah. Um, legal words. <laughs> and now it's 2024. It's nine years later. You're like, shoot, I should probably do that. And maybe somebody's released something that sounds a lot like it. Like, does it, still hold up if you go back register your copyrights for something from like nine years ago now if yes. you were to like okay yes but and i think that's always you're expecting that from a lawyer right yes but mm -hmm. um the protection is going to be limited from the time that you got your registration so okay. if there's any previous infringements you may have lost out on being able to go ahead and go after that person um, because you've lost that, you don't have that registration date from that time because you can only go after somebody from the date of your registration. Okay, right? so you've heard it here first. Let's get those copyrights before the release is out. Oh, I feel or, so bad for all the people I said, don't worry about it. Well, they don't have to necessarily worry about it because remember they do have a, you are right, they do have a copyright when they've made the work and it's original. It's fixed, it's original, it's tangible, it's theirs. But I also have my real estate license and I used to work in real estate law. So it's like building a house, right? You have a house, you're going to insure it, right? Mm. To protect it. It's the same thing with your song. The song is yours. You own it. Absolutely. But you're going to have to have insurance for it. And that's what the registration is for. Because if you need to take it down from a website that somebody may be infringing on your song, or if it happens more than you'd like to say, but if a label happens to take something from your song and use it, in order to file against the label, you have to get registration. And if you wait, yes. you may lose that ability to go ahead and go after them. So the sooner you get your registration, the better. But there's no like time limitation on you being able to register your song. If it's yours and you decide to register it 20 years later, you can register it 20 years later. You're just not going to be able to maybe go after some of the previous violations against that song. And I've heard of so many artists that have had those stories where they um, maybe it's not like from a major label, although we've heard those for sure as well. Um, but on the independent level, I know of artists even on the local level that have said, well, I released this song in 2020 and then my competitor in the industry released a song in 2021 and it sounds a lot like it or they're using the same hook or they're using the same like they sampled it or whatever and they didn't clear copyrights for it. And those things, if you if basically you're saying you need insurance in order to be able to go after people legally. And so if you don't have that insurance, you're screwed. So get the insurance now. <laughs> I wouldn't say the word screwed, but okay. yeah, I I think it makes it more difficult to be able to right the wrongs against you. Let's right. put it that way. Yeah. Have you had some real world examples where like copyright protection really made a big difference for artists you've worked with? Yeah, normally when it comes to, I don't know if you know what the DMCA is, are you familiar? Mm -hmm. The takedown? 
Yes, that's been instrumental with the takedowns. Um, most times when somebody is taking your work, especially on social media, that happens a lot, right? Mm. Um, having that registration, if there is a opposition to your takedown notice, is instrumental in getting stuff taken down. Um, being able to go ahead and move forward and make sure that people can't use your artwork. So that's probably the most immediate. Um, I would say the second is proof of registration it is helpful when it comes to licensing deals with other people, especially if you're in the sync world. Sometimes mm -hmm. they want to have that proof to say, okay, you've obviously made this song, but we want to have proof besides just the paperwork that you've also registered this song and it belongs to you. And that's been helpful too. So I would say in the sync world and in social media are the two places where I think it's most immediate. When you say social media, like what do you give me an example of what you mean by that? Okay, there's Digital Millennium Copyright Act says basically there's uh, certain custodians. These are people that are signed on each social media site, on our websites to go ahead and deal with copyright infringement. So for instance, let's say I have a song on Instagram or on YouTube, um, and maybe I can't afford to get an attorney at the time, right? You can actually send an email to this DMCA custodian and say, hey, this person has infringed on my copyright. I want this song taken off of their you know, video, I want this song taken Got down it. off their site. And then it keeps them from being able to use it. And it also keeps them in line. If they decide to use that with somebody else, they actually get strikes against them for doing this. So, mm. and in future, if they do it again and it becomes malicious and it becomes intentional, there are special damages for that type of thing. You have proof that you've done this before, that they've done it before. And sometimes you can go ahead and go after them in court. Now, getting an attorney is expensive, but there are some attorneys that are willing to take on contingency cases, especially if your case is big enough for notoriety um, to be able to move forward on that case. So that's what a DMCA takedown is. And that's what I mean by social media, just, you know, yeah. what you think, Instagram, <clears throat> YouTube, those places. Yeah, I think that often with social media, people just think it's a huge free for all and that you can use whatever you want whenever you want. Um, you know, obviously, there's a difference between using the music sticker in Instagram Reels and like choosing a song that's publicly available in the Instagram library versus going in and creating a marketing video for your side hustle and using you know, somebody's song without asking permission or without letting them know that that's going to happen. So basically, you're saying the artist is protected by being able to to register a DMCA takedown notice when they're not comfortable with the use of that song. And, but not like from the, the stickers thing. We're talking like if they're- Yeah, no, stickers is a licensing thing. So yeah, if you're yeah, using yeah. the official stickers, that's already been something that has been negotiated between yeah. Instagram and the, the owner and of the, that music. Yeah. Yes, that's not a problem. It's authorized. That's why sometimes you'll use a sticker and you'll see like, we no longer have the rights to use this song on your video. And then you have to right. choose another song. That's because they've lost the licensing rights to that. So that's completely legal and perfectly fine to use. What I'm saying is like, if you ever see somebody who is on TikTok and they transfer the music over and it says original audio, that's an issue because it's not mm. their original audio. Totally. And that happens yeah. every single day, I'm sure. Like, oh, I think, again, people sort of think, oh, it's the internet. I can do whatever I want. Nobody's going to care. But these do have real implications. For example, let's say that is somebody's song. You're using it. It says original audio. A, you're not giving them any credit. Mm -hmm. They're not going to benefit from the, this use in their video. And also now you're just coming off like a real jerk. Um <laughs> So Agreed. what yeah. one thing I wanted to ask about is sort of the opposite side of this. We've had a lot of questions. Um, in fact, I think there's a YouTube comment on one of these videos here somewhere um, that I haven't been able to answer, which is like, like uh, acquiring the license to use, to cover, to um, imitate or whatever a song. So obviously mm -hmm. there's parody, but somebody in particular asked a question. They wanted to use like a Creedence Clearwater revival song, um, but they wanted to change the lyrics to be their lyrics. Um, so obviously in that case, they would have to acquire the rights to use that original melody, right? Yes. Um, and it also depends on how they're using it. Are they sampling it? Or are they interpolating it? I think in this case, these people wanted to basically use the song as if like, you know, hey, Susie Q, I'm going to use the melody. I'm going to use the, 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 yeah, the melody of it. And then I'm going to put my own lyrics to say like, hey, Christina, you know. Um, no, which I get. But what I mean is, okay, so there's sampling and there's interpolating. So there's two ways to do this, to license it. If you're using right. the original, uh, I can never say, I know it's revival. Clearwater? 
Credence? Yeah, sure. Credence, clear one. I don't know that why that's what came out, but whatever. Who Drake? Like, <laughs> so we're using... no, no, I, I know of them. Yeah, yeah. The, I know of yeah. them. The, they're like a huge band from the. Are they from the seventies? Yeah, but so okay. I guess yeah. If we're sampling the original audio track, that's one type of right. right. So what you would need to do if you're if you're taking the original audio from that band, then you actually have to contact the, at this time it's from the seventies. You're clearly going to have to contact the record label owner, right? The record label because you're remember the two copyrights, right? You're going to have mm -hmm. to get it cleared on the sound recording side. Then you're going to have to contact the publisher and get it cleared on the composition side. So that's going to be two people that you're going to, or two entities that you're going, well, at least two entities that you're going to have to reach out to to get it cleared. Now, if the person decides that he wants to play it, like he has the ability to go ahead and play the guitar, like the instrumentation, that's an interpolation. So then he would only have to register it or get clearance from the publisher. So it would save him money if he could interpolate it and then add his own lyrics. So like when you go to Easy Song Licensing, and you're you're getting a license from there. What are you getting? Are you getting like, you know, generally I would say go to that website if you wanted to get a cover song license, if you want to cover something. Um, yes, that's Harry Fox also has um, their own version of that. And that's okay. what they would do as well. Um, and that's usually for an interpolation. I'm not okay. too familiar with easy song licensing, so I couldn't tell you because I don't look at their sure. terms. Yeah. But normally that's going to cover you doing a cover song Mm -hmm. of that song if you want to be able to go ahead and get both sides being able to sample like the actual record that's when you have to go ahead and try to get clearance from the label and from the publisher and then you have to kind of become your own kind of music csi to figure that out how do people do it how do people sample music i don't understand well a lot of times illegally <laughs> the best sure. way to start um but other times there are places like youtube where if you sample they already usually have third party licenses happening in the background where maybe you're not going to get paid because you've done this parody, but you're still able to keep it up and then get the credit and get the momentum and get the fans from it. So that's okay. one way a lot of people get around it. Well, let's say now it's not a interpolation. Maybe it's just I'm writing an original song, but I'm sampling a Madonna track. I'm going to have to go to the label and the publisher, right? So like, how does one even go about doing that? It's not that hard. Um, just finding the information is not terrible. Tracking down people can be really exhausting. And I have to do this in my job a lot. Really? Um, yeah. Samples, clearances is what I've done. Um, like I said, it, it really is a CSI thing. But um, I would start with going to your PRO, putting in the title of the song and the artist, or if you know one of the songwriters, putting their information in, and then they're going to give you the names of the publishers. If you're using SongView, which is the um, merged database between ASCAP and BMI, you're usually covered. If you don't find them there, then you're going to have to go to CSAC to see if it's in CSAC. If it's not there, then you go to the copyright office and you look up the title and you look up the publisher name and hopefully you'll find it there. Usually that's enough. You'll usually find that information through that. For the sound recording side, that's a little bit more difficult, but depending on how old the song is. So mm -hmm. if you are looking for a newer song, usually looking at the song credits on the bottom of Spotify is very helpful in finding out who the label owner is. And then you can actually just call them. I've done that a couple of times. It's much easier than you think. Um, and just wow. asking for a price quote on how much it would be to clear this. Say how long you're going to be using it. Is it going to be used throughout the track? Is it going to only be used for the intro? And that'll help figure out how, like let them figure out how much they should be pricing it. If you're doing it for a charity, they're usually willing to charge you a little bit less, right? For, for a nonprofit, let's say for mm -hmm. like the ASPCA or something. So if you put all that information in your email ahead of time and you give them a phone number or you give them a phone call and tell them this, they'll give you a quote and they'll tell you how much it costs to clear the sound recording side and how much it costs to clear the musical composition side. Gosh, I feel so bad for the like coordinators who ever had to work on Will Smith's Big Willie style because every single song on that album is, has like 20 samples and they're all really, really expensive, I'm sure, to clear. Um, yeah. And it must have been a bear to have to track all that down. I don't know. I don't know why people sample. Honestly, I get it. Like I get why it's fun. But um, how? I don't get it. Well, like I said, um, the other option, which I don't particularly like, but a lot of people do, and sometimes it works. I mean, it's a lot of people illegally infringe first. Mm -hmm. They release it. The song gets really popular. 
Um, let's start with uh, You're My Little Boo Thing. You know that song that was like blowing up? He had not cleared the sample before he released the song. Uh-oh. <laughs> um, no, but it actually worked on his favor. It got so really? big that he was able to go ahead and get the label to talk to him and to get the clearance. But I'm sure they got yeah. a big percentage of it. So there's ways that if you do it illegally and you have a plan, right? You have to have a plan. Um, but if you do, if you're willing to risk it and give that tolerance, then you can go ahead and do that and see if the label comes to you. Because if you're infringing on their work, they're going to come to you. Um, yeah. And then they're going to say like, we want, a percentage of the song it could be work out work out like that guy from um you know the social media the you're my little boo thing guy i cannot remember his name but or it could end up being like um oasis wonderwall where you lose the entire um ownership of the musical composition i missed that what happened with wonderwall they sampled from a, an orchestra and they didn't get it clean oh, okay. and so they lost the composition like recently no, this was a long time ago. Oh, okay. This was, this was, let me see when this was. I mean, Wonderwall came out in the 90s, right? So that must have been, wow. Yeah. So when they, that's what I'm just saying, like, there's two, there's two options that could work out in your favor mm -hmm. um, or you could end up losing everything. But like I said, it's, it's one of those people, like, are you willing to, to risk it all for the song? Yeah. Are you, and uh, if you're a new artist or you're an artist that, doesn't have a ton of money for legal representation. Why risk it? I don't know. I guess like I can understand the idea of like, well, it's sort of a gamble. Like who, if this doesn't blow up, who's going to notice. But at the same time, there's also like all of this automated content inspection in, in the platforms that finds the track or finds even like a clip or a sample and is yeah. able to like, identify it algorithmically and then you're you're yeah yeah in a perfect world i would say it's better to be safe than sorry mm -hmm. but i live in the real world and i also live in the world where universal sony and warner have all sampled before clearing songs Ooh, and well it's true i mean if you look up um infringement for any of those you're gonna find a bunch of cases against them wow. uh, you know so i'm just saying like, i'm being realistic about it so it would be perfect if you could do that. But if you're gonna go the other route and you're gonna you know, take that risk, make sure that you have a plan in place for when someone does eventually reach out to you and say, hey, you're using our song with that authorization, you need to take it down. Or you're gonna be like, okay, well, you know, we weren't sure, we didn't know, or we honestly didn't have the money to go ahead and clear it. And we know mm -hmm. we're, we're wrong, but can we work something out so we can give you a larger percentage of the composition and figure it out. I don't like that way. I don't think that's a good way, but I'm realistic because it works out for some people. Totally. Are there any other like sort of emerging trends that you've noticed good or bad when it comes to copyrights? I mean, copyright is very old. The last big change, um, I mean, the Copyright Act is from 1976, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then we had the DMCA Copyright and the DART Act. The most recent one was the DMCA uh, Copyright Act, but I would say the biggest trend that I've seen that is the incorporation of AI beats into Ooh. songs, um, which is risky just because you can't actually copyright those songs. Right. Right. Um, because the AI a, owns the copyright? AI can't the own the copyright. I did a quiz on that. <laughs> yeah, they can't own the copyright. What happens is, is that you have to have a human creator to get a copyright. That's how it okay. works. So if it's solely AI generated, you can't copyright it. it it's not protected by copyright. Okay. So if somebody uses some sort of algorithm uh, to request a beat from an AI um, and then they use that, they cannot copyright the song that has that beat in it? Is that what you're saying? Well, if they write their own lyrics, the lyrics are going to be protected. But not the beat. But not the beat. Unless, and this is the caveat that I tell people, it's like if you get AI generated work, make sure to change it in some way. Yes, if manipulate you've changed it. it. Exactly. Then now you have some human touch, human changes yes. to it. And now you have human authorship. And now you can go ahead and do that. So that's what I've noticed with that the AI beats and then the use of people's vocals. Like I know that um, Grimes, she has her mm -hmm. own special like voice software where you can mm -hmm. create your song with her voice. And she allows it to happen. And she just expects a split, like a percentage of her of the splits. 
I have so many hot opinions about that, but oh, gonna... let's talk. Okay. Uh, I just, I, I mean, I don't need to open up a big can of worms here, but I think there's a difference between like condoning the use of AI. Um, in the, I, I don't know. I think there's a line. There's a fine line between what's destructive to the human creativity versus mm -hmm. um, what is a tool. And I do think right. that obviously, like there are, there's a lot of use tool usage to AI musically. I think to be able to say, hey, I really need a beat that sounds tropical. It has a hint of, um, like like a Cuban beat in it, but I also wanted to have like a hip hop beat in it. And if something can generate that for you and you can use that to like sort of bounce an idea off of, that's one thing. It's like a calculator. But there's also this other aspect of it where I'm like, where are we letting go of our our brains? <laughs> you know, where are we letting go of the importance of like honing your craft to be able to do those things on your own and like taking ownership off of, I don't know. I just, I have hot takes about AI. <laughs> but. I understand that. And I mean, if, if I would say uh, maybe now 70% of my questions are actually AI related, Whoa. Um, just because I mean, it's, it's such a huge part, especially mm -hmm. with um, Drake and the weekend song being released. Well, it wasn't their mm -hmm. song, but using their voices. Mm -hmm. um, and then that songwriter still being possibly having been considered for billboard or Grammy consideration because the person wrote the song, so the composition side was actually original, right, and fixed, but it was just the voices weren't authorized. And voice usage is in a federal protection. It's state by state. So some hmm. states are more protected than others. So I would say with AI, there's a couple issues. One, that it's not protected by copyright if it's not manipulated by a human in some other way. Um, but it's also hard to detect if it was actually created by AI. So I'm sure there's a lot of registrations out there where people are saying like this everything's copyrightable everything's protectable but they may have actually just used ai beats so yeah. we're in a weird place that's a big gray area where things are just being decided in real time about mm -hmm. what's protected what's not what's not an author who's an author who's not an author yeah. um but yeah that's that's i would say that's the biggest part of what i've been doing now is a lot of like me doing a lot of research, going through a lot of cases that are currently pending about AI work and AI protection. We do have one case that says out of the DC courts that said, no, uh, it's a federal court in DC. And they said, absolutely not. Like you cannot have authorship if it's created solely by software, but yeah. who's to say that's gonna change later on. Mm, I definitely see it going the other way in the future as more like, corporations sort of get behind it and need those regulations to uh -huh. be passed. Um, so I'm really curious to see how it all moves. I think we all are, but I am hesitant. I'm nervous. I'm not excited about the future. Anyway. <laughs> well, before you move on to the next part, though, this is why I think I'm actually kind of excited about it. I don't think it's going to turn out as detrimentally as everybody thinks. Mm. Um, I'm a big buff and I know that when the calculator came out a lot of people who were accountants and math professionals were like it's the end of the world they were protesting right. the calculator okay. so I feel like if this is a lot bigger than a calculator right there's a lot more changes that can happen with it but there are things that are already in the work for detection there are ways to go ahead and make sure that your music isn't scraped like you can put things inside of your music that would help like I say you know producer tags are also helpful too because they take the whole song they scrape it if you see your producer tag on AI generated work, you know it's been used and that's basis for going ahead and filing copyright infringement. So I think that as things move forward, there's gonna be more ways to detect what's actually AI generated and it's going to be easier to protect. But now with copyright, and I could be wrong, and this could be a play against me later on in like 10 years, but that's also why copyright protection is so important now. Because if you can go ahead and protect your legacy, make sure to use it, you want to move forward with that and also mm -hmm. people are still especially if you're a big company because it's so in the air it's a gray area corporations don't like gray areas usually when it comes to their legal liability so they're still mm -hmm. using same companies they're still using people who are actual people to create their music and that hasn't changed as much as people think so i think there's something to be grateful when it comes yeah, to that totally 
Oh, okay. Well, I might have one more question sort of about before we move on about, mm -hmm. I guess, samples in some regard. But when it comes to, let's say I'm using my DAW, I use Ableton, some people use Pro Tools, Logic, whatever. Um, and there are built in samples, right? So maybe I take that built in um, tropical rhythm sample and I put that on my song and I don't manipulate it at all and I put a guitar over it, I put a vocal over it, I publish it, right? And I imagine there are probably 30,000 million other people out there that also have done the exact same thing. So how are those sorts of things protected? Like I don't understand how the license for that is like free for all when it comes to things like content ID or even just copyrights. That's a good question. So with DAWs, so digital audio workstations like Ableton um, and all these other ones that you have, what normally when you have those presets that are already included, they don't most of the time have content ID for that reason. They're trying not to have that issue. Um, and then number two is if you look, I don't know what Ableton's terms of use is off the top of my head, but if you look at the terms of use, they usually allow you to have a commercial license to use all the presets that are in there. So if you use the preset and you release the song, it shouldn't be an issue for you moving forward. Well, if I release the song and I have that beat, that sample under there, and then someone else releases their own song and they have that beat and sample in there, and I've already monetized my song, it's it's available for for YouTube monetization, let's say. And so it's in the content ID library, that my song. Um, will, will it get picked up? by content ID, like if someone else uses the exact same sound and the exact it same might. sample? It, it might, but that's why you want to look at your terms of use. I know people don't like to go through it, but look at what they say about like IP rights and mm -hmm. if it's an exclusive or non-exclusive license or if it's commercial use. Because what you normally all have to do to be able to go ahead and refute that is just show like, I used Ableton, this is an Ableton preset and it's mm -hmm. here and it says that I can use it for commercial use and it's not exclusive, which means that it can be used with a bunch of different people. You show yeah. that, usually that'll get rid and overcome the, the copyright strike that you got. And then also just like the no brainer of it all is human manipulation. Once again, you take that, change it in some way so that it's a little bit different than what someone else may use, right? Sometimes it can still get flagged even when it's manipulated, right? Okay. Because if you have the underlying melody or beat and it's similar to what the other one was before, and you know, sometimes you get flagged for no reason. That happens mm -hmm. where it's like, it is a completely different song, but they're like, they found two chords that sound similar to that other two chords from another song. So that's why I'm saying it's really important. You don't have to read the whole thing, but just look for the part that talks about IP protection. Usually it'll say grant of rights is the section. I'm gonna look up Ableton in terms of these right now, just while sure, we're talking. Sure, why not? Um, but yeah, that usually covers you. And if you just, once they let you know that there's been an issue, you have a chance to go ahead and appeal. It's not mm -hmm. like it's just, you know, be all end all, like we're taking you down. Once you respond with that information, which I've done once or twice before, that'll usually be enough to get you back up and active on your channel. Mm, good to know. Um, okay. Last major question here is how does this all work internationally? Let's say you're an artist that has a global audience, um, you have U.S. copyrights, or let's say you're an outside of the U.S. artist that plans on distributing in the U.S. Um, how does how does that all work? What do you need? How does it? Is there a challenge well, there? No, I mean, I think the hardest part probably is the monetization, but if you are a foreign applicant, you can register in the US. You just have to put what your citizenship is, where the song was created, um, and you can get the registration here in the US um, and vice versa for, you said somebody who is in the US, but is exporting overseas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, you can register here in the US and then there's something called reciprocity. There's a lot of conventions when it comes to copyright mm. where a lot of countries just have an agreement that they're going to respect and protect the copyright protections of other countries. So that's why you're able to go ahead and monetize even though you're in the US and your song gets played in France, your publisher is gonna pay you for the French plays that you get, right? You yeah. get paid for radio in France. Like that's get tracked back to you. So there's not too much issues when it comes to copyright registration globally. Um, you can protect yourself in other countries too. If you're an American citizen and you want to register in France, for instance, or in Italy, you can do that. You can get that protection. You just have to pay the fee to protect yourself in those different countries. But usually U.S. protection is enough to cover you in the other countries that you're looking to monetize under. 
Well, thank you so much. I feel like I've just thrown all of my dumb questions at you and you've They really weren't dumb. Into- <laughs> I was like, some of these were hard. I was like, wait a second. So well, they were they were good. What's funny is that when I saw you speak in Miami, I remember I, like I was raising my hand the most. <laughs> I was like, I kept having so many questions because I, I think this stuff is really interesting. And it's also the part where as a creative, there's so many things to keep track of before, after release, whatever, that yeah. copyrights are one of those things that we end up just like shoving it under the bed and saying, I'll deal with it later. And then years go by and you haven't dealt with it. So um, I guess my biggest piece of advice is don't do what I've done. Go ahead, make sure you get that done. Put it on the checklist for your pre-release checklist. Um, make it as important as registering your songs with your PRO, as important as getting all of your mechanical licenses set up, um, but put that on your checklist. Do you have any advice for how artists can sort of keep track of all of these things? Okay, so I'm going to give you a very lawyerly response. Um, This isn't going to (laughs) be advice. It'll be uh, education uh, and information provided to you. But what I think is the best thing to do is to have your own spreadsheet uh, or disco. If you use disco, I love disco. Um, And they're not paying me for this, but I I personally pay for disco and I like them. Um, Just to go ahead and do your catalog management. I think a lot of people forget that as an artist, you're creating art but you are providing a service to the people listening to your art, right? So you wanna make sure to treat yourself as a business in that sense. Mm. So just catalog it, put, yeah, just put the title of the song. Uh, If it's on an album, what album it was, track list information is important. Um, If you're familiar, ISRC, so your, you know, code for the sound recording, your ISWC, which is the code that you have for your composition, which your PRO gives you. Um, If you are trying to get on billboard, making sure that you put a checklist saying like, yes, I registered with Luminate on this date. Um, if you're trying to get on radio, yes, I registered with Media Base on this date. I'm actually working on doing like a, I have my own spreadsheet that I use, but I'm working on making off for my Substack a spreadsheet for them to like just cool. use to start Template. off with. Yeah. Yeah. Something easy, something super simple. And I'm not actually going to charge them for it because I think that they just need something to start off with, like just with the basic information so they can move forward. Um, and yeah, don't be afraid to ask for help when it comes to copyright mm-hmm. registration too. The copyright office, remember you pay taxes, so whether we want to or not, but you pay taxes. Ooh, good so point. the copyright office has a helpline and I've called them myself plenty of times and they're very, very, very helpful. Call in the morning. Usually that's when you have the older ladies and they're very nice. Like between eight and 10, they're, <laughs> they're willing to stay on the phone with you for like 30, oh 45 God. minutes. Yeah. I'm always really surprised, actually, when friendly people pick up on really intimidating. I like recently had to, I had to have a phone call with the IRS. <laughs> I know, and they're actually very friendly, <laughs> right? Nice yeah. Ever, and they're like, "Oh yeah, honey, don't worry, we'll give you an extension." And I was like, "What?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't worry. Oh, you know what? Here's how you fix this. And I was like, so grateful. But yes, you do pay taxes. There are services out there that you already pay for. So don't double pay. Call. Mm -hmm. Customer service exists at the copyright office. So very good advice. Uh, Mm -hmm. Information and education, yes. Sorry. Very good information and education. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) I want to have you on all the time because we have so many, so many questions, um, legal questions that people have, and there are so many topics to discuss. So um, consider this the first of many helpful interviews between us. I would would be super excited because you know how I feel about the DIY music podcast. Like I'm a big fan of this place. Um, I did look up Ableton. Okay. Okay. Ableton grants you a personal, limited, non-exclusive license to use and or copy the Ableton products. But I'm trying to see license restrictions really very quickly. I'm trying to scan through it. Okay, so use of unmodified materials appearing in isolation, including but not limited to film or game soundtracks is not permitted. Um, You may use the... contained uh, materials such as presets, sound samples, loops, musical phrases, and music examples to create your own musical prop compositions. So it's cleared, provided that additional material is added. So mm. your question that you asked me before, if you did it, but you didn't add anything additional to it, would not would qualify as a breach of these terms of conditions. So you've got to add some stuff to it 
to then make it original, then to release it. So you should be okay. Add a vocal, add a guitar, add whatever, but add yes. something. Don't yes. just like take a sample from Ableton and publish it and say you did, you made music. Right. Um, it's which, in paragraph 53C in case anybody wants to look at it. It's right there. Yeah. I wonder if somebody were to like, because I'm sure this happens all the time, especially with like the lo-fi genre. I'm just going to call out lo-fi for a minute. Like, just, There are a lot of Nintendo samples that aren't clear that I personally love and listen to that I'm not going to put on blast. <laughs> right. I know. I'm sure people do that all the time where they just yeah. say, mm -hmm, published and then try and get a sync license out of it. <laughs> well, that's the other thing I would say. If you're going to do this, I'm glad you brought this up. If you're going to do this and you're going to go the route of like, let's see what happens. Do not try to get that song synced. What's going to mm. happen to you is, especially if it's used in a brand campaign on a TV show, places like CBS, production mm -hmm. companies, they will come after you with a vengeance yes. if they get sued. So don't do I've that. Also, I've also seen it completely block opportunities. I, I worked with an artist um, as their publicist for a while mm -hmm. and they had an opportunity to potentially use one of their songs in like a cosmetic campaign. It was oh, a huge nice. company. Yeah. It was really great, but they had a sample and they didn't mm -hmm. clear it. And basically the cosmetic company said, oh yeah, well, we're not going to clear We're not going to pay for you to clear that sample. So unless you can clear it, um, we're not going to use the song. And you know, that costs somewhere up to like 20, way more than they would have made off of the, right. the license itself. So opportunities like that could could not work out for you if you haven't cleared those things in advance. So um, definitely important to take care of business. And it is a business. Like you don't just like release food without getting an FDA <laughs> clearance, right? Like you don't True. just like sell it at Whole Foods without... I mean, I guess some people do. Well, and I want to be clear. I don't know if anyone saw this this movie, which is, is a terrible movie. I mean, it's a good movie, but it's like the premise is terrible. But it's called The Menu. Did anyone ever see it? Yeah, I did see that. That was good. Love that, was that really movie. Intense. Yeah. It was super. That's what I mean by bad. It was like it was super intense. But he yeah. I would I think since you've seen it, you would agree that he is an artist. He really right. respects his craft, um, but he is running a business, too. I don't mm -hmm. think just because you're running a business, it's going to distract from your art. You're just looking for a way to protect it and make sure that other people can enjoy it in the way that you intended for people to hear it, perceive it, or receive it, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what I think is important. Don't think because you're handling the business side of things that somehow you are no longer an artist or you're diminishing your art. If anything, mm -hmm. it tells me that you are protecting it enough and caring about it enough to do things the right way. And if anyone Absolutely. gets anything from this, that's what I would say. The copyright protection was for um, and I, one last thing, cause I, I feel like I forgot one thing, but Harry Fox does do, um, sample clearances as well. Oh, and, right. I, and I'm sorry, not sample clearances. I'm sorry. They handle, um, no, they do do sample clearances. And the fact that if you want to go ahead and do an interpolation, you can do it with them, uh, through their filing system. They do have a program. I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but. It is I don't want to open up a whole other can of worms, but really quickly, um, yes. an interpolation in that case, if you were to sample, you know, the 10 second loop of, of a Alicia Keys song or whatever, and then you're like, it's your song, but you're just sampling it. Is that an interpolation or is that just a sample? Are you replaying? It's playing in the background. The song, it's part the of the beat and the loop is playing in the background. You're singing your own song on top of it. Okay, I think my disconnect is how did you acquire the loop? Did you actually take it from the sound recording or did you take a piano and play it yourself? Because that'll make the difference in how you get your clearance. If you took I it guess, from I mean, her, the record, is that what you mean? You took it from the record and you Yeah, yeah, it? you like, took yeah, 10 seconds gonna, off the record. It doesn't matter if you take a second off of it. There's no time constraint on how much you take. I get that mm -hmm. question a lot too, actually. Like, yeah. If I want to take a second, will it? No. If you take 10 seconds from there, you got to clear both sides. If you okay. play it on your own harpsichord, maybe that's what you're playing or a sure. piano, then you'd only have to clear one side, which is the uh, the musical composition. And it's called song file. That's how you okay. license songs through a Harry Fox agency. And Thank easy file, so like Christina said. Thank you so much for coming. I feel really grateful to have you on and I look forward to talking to you soon.
thank you for having me. This was really great. And um, yeah, I'm really excited to have been on the podcast. And how can people find you? Um, I know that you have the Latte Lawyer online. Um, I'll I'll link all of this in the bio as well. Okay. Um, I'm very easy to find. I used to be on Twitter. I refuse to call it X. I'm off of that now. <laughs> um, I have a TikTok that I don't use that much. And I am on Instagram mostly. And I have a Substack, which is a newsletter that I cool. prepare every week, which I'm walking you through checklists on how to deal with the industry. Last week was registering with, um, so you can get billboard consideration. This week was um, the BOI reporting requirement. So your business is in compliance with um, federal right. uh, issues that are happening now. Great. Well, we'll link to the Substack stack um, down below. All right. Well, thank you so much. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Christina.